This is my first solo video with you. Yay! I got a Nathaniel. I got a Nathaniel. Also, I'm pretty sure I'm a bit too prepared because I have a document with just things that I'm reminding myself to say. <laughs> You're more prepared, more prepared than, than, I than you are. <laughs> Hi, I'm Amy, and this is A Star Reads. And today we are going to be doing a review of *Of Mice and Men*. I'm going to be doing it with my nephew Nathaniel. So tell us who you are, Nathaniel. I am Amy's nephew, 14, and I had to read this for school. <laughs> and I made you buddy read it with me. Yep, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Was that the worst experience ever? No, but the questions I got for the book were definitely a lot easier than the questions you asked me. <laughs> <laughs> Fair the enough. questions Fair in enough. school, I just had to, oh, hey, what's an obvious answer? This one, and not the ones that don't make any sense. With Amy, it's, okay, so how does that make you feel? <laughs> oh, is that it? Explain your thinking. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a pain in the butt, aren't I? <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> Let's first give a description of this book without giving spoilers. Without spoilers. Yes. Okay, so the main idea of the book is you're following these two characters around, George and Lenny. They're best friends and they're working through Southern California? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they end up on this ranch where they work for the next week and i don't know how to go from there without spoiling anything <laughs> oh right okay yeah so they also meet some of the workers there and the boss who is curly not the best person you would say but then you have the four other people who are working there there's carlson who isn't very important to the story. You don't talk to him much other than one time. Uh, you have Slim, who is kind of the leader there, who gets respect. And then we have Candy, who is an older guy there and ends up becoming more friends with George and Lenny. Then you have Crooks, who is in his own place, and he's the stable buck. And... One more. Curly's wife. Yes. And you have Curly's wife who is treated pretty badly in the book. But later you learn more about her and you understand who she actually is. Can you tell us a little bit about Lenny and George? Actually, a good way of actually explaining these two, I think, is if you've seen it, uh, Animaniacs, Pinky and the Brain. <laughs> you got oh, the perfect. shorter one who was more the brains of the whole operation. And then you got the stronger taller and not a smart one <laughs> wow nathaniel that is a great comparison i never even thought especially about especially because i'm pretty sure most of your audience will understand that <laughs> yes pinky in the brain is perfect and that yeah. is very accurate because george is the one who is kind of taking care of lenny and is the ringleader in a yeah. sense of their little buddy group buddy and then group. lenny brings the heart you know yeah. kind of like pinky brought the heart yeah. Also, yeah. if you watch the new reboot, then you can see that it's even more similar. Because in that one, Rain actually kind of cares about Pinky instead of just being an asshole. I've never seen that re it reboot. Is it any good? I haven't seen it either. I just remember seeing a clip. It was like kind of like their past. And at some point, Rain remembered it. And then he felt bad for Pinky. Actually, that's pretty accurate to George and Lenny also. Because, you know, George made fun of Lenny when he first yeah. knew him. The turning point for them was George jokingly said, because Lenny couldn't swim well at the time, at least, uh, told him to grab something from the river and he ended up almost drowning. And then at that point, George was like, oh, he trusts me. I should take care of him. And then they, that's where we kind of go into their friendship. You remember a lot more of this book than I thought you were going to. <laughs> I ha this is like the first book I've read in a while. I read the same books over and over again. What are some of your favorite books? Just so our, our friends know here. Ooh, what are ones that someone would actually know? <laughs> Series of Unfortunate Events. There you go. Thank you, Mom. I will say there's another book that I read that I did like. If you're the faint of heart, you shouldn't read it. A Dog's Purpose. <laughs> I remember you telling me about that. 
Yes, it's so sad. Did you cry? Yes, multiple times. <laughs> did you cry for this one? Uh, I did not cry. My mom is also shaking her head, agreeing with me about me crying to a dog's purpose. <laughs> okay, so I think that Daniel pretty much covered it all. This is a story about Lenny and George and their buddy relationship. They end up going to this new farm where they're doing some work and things happen. And we follow that story. What is your review, Nathaniel? I mean, it was, I liked it. I also liked, um, with John Steinbeck, this is the first book I read of his, but he seems to really care about the setting and the mood of each individual chapter. Occasionally it could be foreshadowing or it could just be immersing you in the story. What do you think about the characters? Did you like John Steinbeck's characters? Did you think that he did a good job of describing them? I think the characters were great. Like the pairing between George and Lenny, that's, uh, it is a used pairing that you've seen multiple, that you've seen a few times, but I don't know because this book came out a while ago. But we've seen a few characters like that, like Pinky and the Brain, for example. For the characters that you you think are bad, like they make you like kind of feel like, oh, you feel sorry for them, like Curly's wife. For almost the whole book, you kind of hate her. Like she's she's seen as everyone in the book as well as to be not a good person. And then at one point she starts actually like you, she talks about her character herself. And then you understand that no, she's just misunderstood. She's not actually this horrible person that we think she is. Do you think that uh, John Steinbeck was really intentional in the way he made the characters in order to make a point as for you? Well, some writers, yes. I just want you to have a story and it helps you escape. You get to be in this other world. But a lot of the times, authors will include a deeper meaning to it or just other meanings in the book that can teach you about the real world and what you should think. For example, Curly's Wife, don't judge a book by its cover. And if someone's being mean, there's probably a reason. They're not just being mean to be mean most of the time. They have something that's going on at home or just they're not exactly like in a good spot. So they feel like they have to project it on other people. Okay. One of the things that I was trying to drag out of you the whole time we were reading this together was all the hidden meanings behind everything, which I know drove you nuts because you were like, I, I like to think of things as being really straightforward. And John yes. Steinbeck doesn't write that way. He's not straightforward. He has a lot of yes. symbolism in what he writes. No books are straightforward. <laughs> sucks. I like it to be straightforward. Black and white. It's how they, I like it. It's easier to understand if there's one answer and that's what it means. <laughs> so my question is, what did you think about reading a book where there's so, for one, that there's so much symbolism in, and two, me forcing you to think about it? <laughs> I mean, I will say, that's what all books in school are for. They're supposed to, they're supposed to actually teach you something. And actually, for this book, it's about ethics and morals. I find, like, with almost every school book I've read, with an exception of, like, two, I've actually enjoyed the story of it. I've never exactly enjoyed the work on it because I don't like work, but <laughs> I liked the books themselves. I find like the questions I do with Amy, like I have to think about it, like occasionally they can be kind of annoying, <laughs> but in reality, it helps you understand the book more and what the author is actually trying to say. And especially with Amy, considering her love of John Steinbeck, it's a lot, <laughs> it's very helpful to actually kind of understand one, there's a lot of language because they don't just like write it down. They talk in the accents they would have. Mm -hmm. And occasionally that can be a bit confusing because yeah. it's the 21st century and they're talking in like 1960 language. Yeah, you know, I know. And though that was one that part that you struggled with quite a bit was being able to understand the slang and the dialect that they were using because yeah. it is different. Even the things they're talking about, things that we don't really come across very often anymore because technology is different. The way we talk is very different. But I'm also in theater and I have to read Shakespeare. So it's a lot easier to read this than Shakespeare. Oh yeah, agreed. Let's cut the BS, Nathaniel. Did you actually like this book though? Or are you yes. just saying that to be nice? No, I did. I haven't encountered a book that I didn't like to read other really? than, I mean, I'm sorry, but Romeo talks too much. <laughs> so Shakespeare you're not a fan of Romeo and Juliet, huh? Yes, 
you're great. Tabal was pretty cool. Uh, Benvolio, he was pretty cool. Mercutio, he's amazing. But Romeo, he can't shut up. <laughs> he can't. Hey, Mom like... agrees. <laughs> All right, all right, all right. Let's get back on track. My brain stopped. Okay. Spoilers. Now let's talk spoilers. Okay, so we know that you like the book. Whoa. We talked a lot about morality because your class actually wanted to know a lot about morality. And we were talking a lot about m- murdering and whether or not murdering, even in the name of protecting your friend, is okay. I believe George was completely in the right killing him. Don't think murdering in most cases is right. But in this case, I think it was the correct thing to do. Mostly to spare Lenny mentally and physically. Physically, because if he hadn't shot him like that, clearly says that he was going to shoot him in the gut. I don't know if you know this, but that's not going to kill you immediately. (laughs) It's going to be a painful death and not a clean death. And he would be wallowing in pain and knowing Curly, he probably wouldn't kill him outright. Yeah. Because he's upset. Yeah. So that would be sparing him physically and also mentally if George and all of them came at the same time and Curly shooting him, then Lenny would realize that George betrayed him. Yeah. And having your best friend betray you ain't fun. No. Not a good way to die. I don't the think only- Amy would be happy if my mother betrayed her. <laughs> Better not. I'll kill her. No, what is going on? <laughs> Uh, Especially we got from the foreshadowing with Candy's dog. There was this conversation around what is right and what is wrong. And is it fair for this dog that she's living this life of pain and exhaustion and and whatnot? And what's the best way to end that life? And And that question came in consideration in the end. The same exact question. What's the better way to go? When what's fair and what's right? And I agree with you. I feel very strongly that if Lenny had been betrayed by George it would have been more painful all around like it was obviously painful for George for him to have to shoot his best friend but even more so if he knew that his best friend died feeling betrayed because of him yeah he died painfully especially because Lenny doesn't understand he knows what he's doing is wrong in a sense that people have told him it's wrong but he doesn't understand it I made a big deal with you about talking about Curly's wife and I know that that was a conversation we went into a lot of detail in, but that was because I told you that I had heard that people who've been watching the play of Mice and Men like hate her so much that they actually laugh when she dies. And to me, that was really distressing because I see her as a character who maybe we hate when we read about her in the book, but I feel like she's very misunderstood. Like, yeah, you're taught to hate her because she's kind of being weird with Lenny. And yeah, and everyone talks shit about her. And when you when you hear what they're saying, it makes sense. But then at the end, it's like, oh, that everyone was wrong, and she's just she's not with the best husband. And if she talks to anyone else that's not a girl, then she looks like she's a tart. Or, yeah, that's what they use. That was the term they use a lot in the book. Yeah, I yeah, it was that. really sad because even though she may be annoying, she says horrible things about crooks. She does terrible things. I mean, she's not doing good things, but she's not a happy person. She doesn't have a good life. She doesn't have any opportunities. She doesn't have any freedom or any rights or any choice in what she does. And what she wants more than anything is attention. And for her, in this case, the only kind of attention she can get is the bad yeah. kind, but at least it's some, right? But, yeah. And that was the intention is, is to say, like, you know, I know we see these people as bad people, but there's reasons for it. Last question. Are you yeah. ready for this? Are you ready for this? Dun, 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 dun. Oh, no, no, sorry. Oh, it might also afterwards explain more about ethics and morals. Because okay. I know we- Considering this book was written in 19, uh, 1937. Oh, right? 30s. Do you feel that this book is valuable for you as a person to read today in 2021? The actual things that are happening in it aren't, you can't really compare those two today because even with George Mercy killing Lenny, that would not hold up in our society. I hope not. <laughs> I will say the actual like meanings behind everything, yeah, that can be kind of compared to today. Like the actual, not directly the problems, but what the problems are kind of about. Okay. Those can kind of be compared to by today's standards. 
Tell me uh, more about morality and society, Nathaniel. Thank you. In the world we live in today, you are taught at a very young age to conform to the rules of society. Like sometimes you don't do things because you feel they're the best for everything. You do things because you are forced to, and if you don't, you're punished. For some things that make sense, like, I'm sorry, but I don't care if you think it's okay to murder someone, usually it isn't. <laughs> some cases it is, most of the time it's not. There's a lot of things with society that if you think they're right, it doesn't matter unless society agrees with you. How do we tie that into what we were already saying, Nathaniel? I don't know. I, ethically and morality, I can kind of relate that to the book. I don't know how I related that. To- the way you related that to the book when we had our discussion was we were talking about the morality behind murder and how from a moralistic perspective we can understand why George killed Lenny and we feel like in that situation it was the right thing to do but But because society disagrees there's always those questions of morality which are kind of complicated and tricky because individually we may feel something very specific about how we feel about morality but we have to kind of live by the rules of society or else we're ostracized or get in trouble for example Probably the most famous ethical slash moral dilemma, the trolley problem. <laughs> I talk a lot about this. Yes, Nathaniel so likes the trolley problem. problem. Yes, I do. I love this kind of conversation. <laughs> so the trolley problem, if you don't know, is there is a train, it's called trolley, that's heading towards five people working on a railroad. And it will hit them and kill them. But you are standing by lever that if you pull it, will divert it to a different track, but there's one other person working there. So the dilemma is, do you save the five people and kill the one, or do you let it go? And actually, in multiple uh, studies of this, where one, they asked, and two, there's a virtual simulation, 90% of people said they would pull the lever. But... There's a slightly different version. And there's two of them. One are more serious. The other version is there's five people all working on the bridge. Same thing. Except instead of you being able to pull a lever, you're on a bridge above it. And there's a overweight guy watching the scene unfold. So you could push the guy onto the tracks off the bridge to stop the train and save the five people. It's the same thing statistically. But it was 70% said they wouldn't do it. Right. It's murder. Because, that's, a, that's the point. Yeah. Because yeah. in that situation, it yeah. feels more personal. And then there was one more where 99% of people, about 99% said they would let the five people die. Because this one's a lot more morbid when you think about it. So you have five guys who are all missing one major organ. And they need it. And if they don't get it, they'll die. But there's another completely healthy guy in another room with all the organs that you needed. Like one's missing heart, one's missing lung. And the question was, do you perform an autopsy on the one guy to save the five people? Again, statistically, the exact same thing. But almost no one said yes, that they would do it. Because at that point, it's even more personal. If in every single one, you said you would save the five people, then you would follow with utilitarianism. (laughs) Using big words. You're just Nathaniel. (laughs) Which is basically doing whatever it takes to save the majority. Yeah. So, and, that's, and that's not realistic in the way society is or in the way we are as humans, though, because we are much yeah. more emotional than that. Completely different philosophy, but it's still a philosophy. We do. I mean, these are these are the dilemmas that make morality questions so difficult, though. And that and that's it's similar to what Steinbeck is trying to think about or look at in this book. He's really trying to look at what is right and what is wrong morally. And really, can you make that decision easily? It's not an easy decision. It's very complicated. I feel like what's happening now is I'm talking about some like random stuff that actually is kind of smart. And then you actually have to do the hard job of making it connect to the book. 
<laughs> yeah, Nathaniel, I'm trying to keep us on topic. I know this is hard yes, for us, but we have to stay on point. <laughs> hey, hey, if it helps, tell me one more thing I have to bring up. Okay, so, one more thing. Okay. So it's about the book. Okay. So <laughs> you make it related to the book. Said, it's more an ethical stuff. Okay. Uh, so kind of. <laughs> Shush, okay? You're uh, making my job hard. I know I do. But it makes my job more fun. <laughs> Earlier I said that most of the time I follow what is utilitarianism. But some people will strictly follow it. Random trivia fact time. There was this 1700s philosopher named Kant. K-A-N-T. This morally is talking about lying. So at first glance, you would think, oh, you shouldn't tell a lie. Like almost never. That's what he thought. He thought no matter what, you should never tell a lie. But sometimes we do. Like, sometimes it makes sense that we should. Um, for example, if some random guy is asking, hey, where do you live? I don't think you want to tell him your real address. Someone brought this to him. And this was probably one of the bigger things that he was asked. If a known murderer came to your house and asked where your friend was to kill them, would you tell him the truth? For almost, I, at least I hope, everyone watching this, you would lie. Yeah. He thought you should still tell the truth. And that the murderer's actions were not your fault. He was an extremist. Yeah, a bit. Yeah, just a bit. It wasn't that. <laughs> I don't know um, how to bring that back to this, Nathaniel. Uh, morally and ethically, bad things couldn't be said for the for a good reason. Yeah, something considered bad couldn't be used for good. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Like and in this case, stuff. what we would consider bad, murdering your friend, is actually the more humane choice. Well, not good, but better. Humane, better. more humane. You know, of all the bad outcomes, it gives you the, the least worst outcome. All right, Nathaniel. Well, I think we beat this book. Yeah. Pretty we bloody. A lot of stuff that wasn't this book. And we, we went off on random, you went off on random tangents. Yeah, I was about to say, I read about stuff not completely <laughs> relating to the book. But they had to do with morality, which was a big portion of what this book was all about. We were talking about and morality. And then the book also talked about what is ethical and moral within the society. What is moral and ethical about how Crooks is treated, about how Curly's wife is treated. We, we have questions about what is correct. And that has a lot to do with the time, but it's pretty applicable to what we talk yeah. about nowadays. Like, it, doesn't, it hasn't changed much. Like, the actual dilemmas... Yes, that is something that might happen. But the actual, like, way up to it and how they were handled, different. Yeah, I mean, it's a different like, time. Back then, what George did might have actually slid. Now, yeah. not at all. Yes, I agree with you, Nathaniel. I think that it is a valuable book for the lessons you learn. It, it does not necessarily reflect how, time, how things are now. Thank you so much, Nathaniel. Will you ever read another book with me again? Uh, probably, because next school book, you'll probably make me buddy read with you. Well, everybody, you, that's what you have to look forward to. So if you like this video, click the like button. Subscribe if you want to see more of my handsome, charming, young nephew, Nathaniel, because he has a lot of thoughts and opinions. And uh, Subscribe if you want to hear 30-minute rants about something that's not related to the actual point of the video. <laughs> exactly. Thank you so much for watching, and we will see you later. Bye. Bye.